probably be the right one for that song. Well, I want to start to talk today, and I'd like to ask you to turn to someone sitting next to you or nearby you, and each of you give your definition of the word attitude. All right, take a moment just right now, like maybe 30 seconds, and each of you say, this is what I think attitude means, the word attitude means. All right, take off. My guess is that maybe you said things like, attitude is the frame of mind that you approach your life with, something like that. You might have used the word disposition, it's like the general disposition of your life. Or you might have said something like, it's sort of the inner demeanor of your life that expresses itself in your, in your behaviors and your words. Well, let's do one more little audience participation, and that is, what is a one word description you can think of for people that carry? a negative attitude, a positive attitude, or whatever. What is just a one word? You say, that guy has a, or that woman has a, what would be one word? A sour attitude. A bad attitude. That's kind of generic, but, huh? An unhappy attitude. A positive attitude. Optimistic attitude. You could say a friendly attitude. If you're going to do more than one word, you could say they have a can-do attitude. Uh, people have a lousy attitude, or these days we say they have an attitude of entitlement. Uh, or you can just say they got attitude, and you know what that generally means. Well, we could go on and on, but let's personalize this a little bit. Let's say if your friends or family members or coworkers were asked to describe what kind of attitude that you have, what kind of words do you think they would describe saying Siobhan has or you know, Doug has, this is, this is the kind of general attitude that they have. <laughs> Doug, I'm not just trying to be, you know, personal there, but uh, for you, what would it be for you? How do you think they would describe your attitude? Well, another angle of how important is a person's attitude to whether or not you like to be around them? If you were to weigh it against other qualities, where would attitude rank? For instance, if you were hiring someone, say they had really great skills, but a terrible attitude. Would you go ahead and hire them anyway? Would you hire you know, competency over attitude, or would attitude override competency? If you were dating someone, would you choose brains or attitude? Would you choose looks or attitude? You're thinking, that's a tougher one. But if you gave that a little bit of thought, you would or should eventually choose attitude. How important is it? It is of supreme importance to your life over the long haul. Attitude really matters. A poor attitude can destroy a marriage, it can destroy a family, a business, a team, even a church. Negative attitudes and sour attitudes are extremely destructive. And they're contagious. And I think the classic example from scripture about the infectiousness of a, a negative spirit is the story of the Israelites when they were delivered from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, you think, well, they would be nothing but grateful for a long time to come. God has done these miraculous things. He sent the 10 plagues uh, against Pharaoh. He's parted the Red Sea. He's provided drinking water from a dry old rock, sending manna every morning to, from heaven to feed them. And yet in spite of all that, there was widespread complaining that would crop up from time to time. And, you know, Numbers chapter 11 says it all began with a small handful of people, and it spread, and it spread, and it spread. And before long, there were a whole bunch of them griping, you know, all we have to eat is this manna. Manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. They said, Moses, there's only so much you can do with that stuff. There's manna pancakes, you know, manna burgers, manna cotty, McManna McNuggets. I mean, we're sick of these manna, this manna. And even Moses is starting to get affected. He goes to God and he says, why did you make me the leader of this ungrateful group of people? Every day they come to me griping like it's my fault. You know, come on, God, what did I do to deserve this? A negative attitude is highly contagious. And here's something 
pretty serious to think about. Whichever way you approach life, it has a way of affecting others, especially your kids. So parents, grandparents, future parents, one of the greatest gifts that you can give your children is to model for them and to help them to develop a great attitude toward life. Here's another reason it's important. Proverbs 17, 22 tells us that a cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Haven't you had your own life experiences proven that to be true? I mean, it is a fact that grumpy, negative people are sick more often than cheerful people. And so cheerful, a cheerful spirit is a medicine. Attitude is exceedingly important. Now here's a question. Is it possible for people to change their attitude? For instance, if you wind up with, for whatever reason, circumstances, if you wind up with a negative, rotten disposition, Can you do anything to change it? Let's just take a vote. If you think you can change your attitude, you have the power to change it, do a thumbs up. If you think you can't, do a thumbs down. Those of you with your thumbs down have a bad attitude (laughs) about this. All right? It is possible. And I hope you'll, you know, we'll all listen today for those other people, not for us. Recently, someone gave me a little paper that went like this. It said, Dear Lord, so far today I have not gossiped, I have not lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, or selfish. I have not whined, complained, criticized, or eaten any fattening food. However, I will be getting out of bed in a minute, and I think I will really need your help at that time. (laughs) I think I've told you guys before about one of uh, Jana's grandmothers, people, not to her face, but they called her the griping granny because all she did was gripe and complain. And at her funeral, poor thing, this minister was trying to be nice. He said, I never heard an unpleasant word come out of her mouth. And we're all going like, are we, are we at the right place? We need to check the program. We may have, but uh, people say nice things at funeral that aren't always. But, you know, people possessed by the spirit of ne- neg- negativity, they really do believe that they're always picked out to be mistreated by others. They really believe that the boss and the referees and all the breaks of life are unfair. There is usually a very high complaint level in their words. They tend to blame others for their problems. They have a critical comment about just about everything. It's as if a spirit of negativity hangs over them like a dark cloud. And they can feel it often, and other people around them can feel it. And maybe the hardest thing about it is that oftentimes they do not recognize this in themselves. It's as if they have on the opposite of rose-tinted glasses, and they wear some, through some lens that causes them to see the world as warped and unfair always and distorted and unpleasant. You know, I know of someone personally who recently worked up the courage to have a heart-to-heart with her mother about this kind of thing. And she said, Mom, I love you, and I want to spend time with you, but, you know, you, you could just be really negative and controlling. And her mother said, you really think I'm negative? She's like, yeah. Like every word that comes out of your mouth is is negative and critical. This woman is like over 60 years old, and she doesn't see it in herself. And here's the hard truth. Some of us sitting in this room today may suffer from more of a negative spirit than we're aware of. And I don't know where it may have started in your life. Maybe somehow when you were really young, through family circumstances that got your life on a trajectory that was exceedingly difficult. Or maybe things were fine in your childhood, but... Maybe when you were a teenager or a young adult, something really, really bad happened. A betrayal, someone hurt you at a deep level. And since then, you just, you know, you haven't had the same resilient spirit you did before. All of us experience failures in life. But some people experience failures in a different way, and it just, they, they have a really hard time bouncing back. Maybe it's a jealousy of other people. Maybe it's simply that. You know, you tend to focus on the unpleasant things in life rather than trying to focus on the good things. But it it can become like a toxic cloud that hangs over you, choking out the joy of life and even damaging other relationships, pushing people away sometimes. And maybe you've been dimly aware that something like this is happening, but you've never had the courage to really face this. And I'm asking you to kind of face it today. So what is attitude? How important is it? Is it possible for people to experience a dramatic change in their attitude? Which I think we've said yes. Which leads to the question of how. How does it happen? 
And I would just say two things. Take responsibility would be A. Take action would be B. Whose job is it to change your negative, sour disposition into a positive, upbeat, and optimistic attitude? If I ask whose job is it, you should say, it's my job. Let's all try that together, OK? One, two, three. It's my job. It's my job. It's our job. You may want it to be your spouse's job. You may want it to be your boss's job or your friend's job. We all want it to be someone else's job, but it's not really the case. It is your job to improve your attitude on a daily basis. It is your responsibility. In the Old Testament, there's a story about two women, Ruth and Naomi. Both of these women, I mean, if you were a woman in, mid, in those, those times, in early times in, in the you know, Mideastern culture, you were mistreated. You were treated as a piece of property. You had no value. Not only did they have that, just being women, they had suffered extra unfair mistreatment. They had the death of spouses and even the death of children. I mean, each of them had suffered way more than their share of hardship. And if you read to the end of their stories, this is in the Old Testament book of Ruth, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, you'll see that while adversities turn Naomi into a, a very bitter, unhappy woman, Ruth somehow emerged from her hardships a better, sweeter person than she was before. Life, I think, works this way. You are ultimately the only person who can be responsible for the attitude and outlook of your life. And I know that some of you may, may be thinking, well, that's all well and good for you to talk about having a great attitude. You don't know some of the stuff I've been through. You don't know about the losses that I've suffered. You don't know about how bad things are at work or how painful my upbringing was or how difficult problems and circumstances I'm facing in my life right now. You just don't understand. And you're right. Only God really knows. Nobody but God knows the unseen scars of your life. But I do know and believe this. People who somehow develop and maintain a spirit of optimism live better lives than those who live under a cloud of despair. People who somehow, some way, figure out how to finally get back to an optimistic, you know, trusting God attitude live better lives than people who continue to live in despair. I call it faith optimism. It's not just human, uh, humanistic optimism, but faith optimism. It allows us to walk closer to God, be more likely to embrace today and anticipate tomorrow, it causes us to be more likely to feel gratitude and joy. And that may be really difficult for some of us. Maybe you feel like, I just received cranky genes from my parents. They were cranky. My grandparents were cranky. Well, if you have to spend most of your life fighting off those cranky genes, fight them. You got to do it. Maybe you were born with a temperament, an emotional compass that's magnetic north, just naturally points south. You know, to negative thoughts and negative emotions. And you're going to have to fight that. Fight it. Because you are the person who has to live the rest of your life. And there are people around you who are affected. But you mostly are affected. Do you really want to live the remaining years of your life in a pessimistic, defeated state of mind? And if not, who's going to fix it? Your parents, probably not at this stage. Your friends, no. Your spouse, probably not. Some mysterious, unforeseen force or circumstances to come along and just rescue you like you win the lottery. Well, that doesn't even last very long for most people. It's your job. Now, God will help you. I want to say this is a self-help thing. God will help you. But nevertheless, you have to take responsibility to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes until you develop the habit. That's what it is, really, a habit of a great attitude, and it's not easy. We all know any long-standing habits are hard to break. But the habit of a negative, sour disposition must eventually be broken. How? Well, first of all, take responsibility for it. Second, take some action. And I just want to throw out a few suggestions that I think can help. Number one would just be to take a time out. Most of us do not effectively do attitude adjustments on the fly. When you're going from meeting to meeting, class to class, activity to activity, and your attitude is getting worse and worse, take a time out. You don't need half a day. You probably don't even need half an hour. 
Just get by yourself for a few moments, two, three, five minutes, and just stop and say, is this really the kind of person that I want to be? Do I really want to regurgitate this sour attitude all over my friends and family and coworkers? Is this the kind of person that I want to be before God? This taking a little solitude moment or time out is consistent with Scripture. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Often it requires some stillness to get God back into the equation. A second thing is pray. As David was, uh, King David was the Old Testament, in the Old Testament was just an emerging leader. One time he takes his troops out to battle. And while they're away, the enemy sweeps into Jerusalem, kidnaps their children, their wives, burns all their belongings, and takes their families and wives into captivity. Well, when David and his men return, they are understandably distressed and angry. The troops are so upset, in fact, that they turned on David and contemplated killing him. And being a pastor, I've had that happen to me a couple of times. But anyway, well, David becomes aware of their plans, and you know what he does? He goes off by himself, and as 1 Samuel 3, 30, verse 6 says, he found strength in the Lord his God. He took time. He prayed. He got alone, and he prayed. And afterward, he came back. He re-envisioned his troops. He led them to recapture their families, brought them home. And David's changed attitude was powerful enough to affect the attitudes of all the people around him. Number three, watch your words. When our attitude is bad, that's when we say things that hurt the people that we love. Ephesians 4.29 speaks right to it. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only words that will benefit and encourage other people. Haven't you had a really bad day, and you found out later, you know, if I had just kept my mouth shut, I probably would have greatly minimized the damage that I did, you know, until my attitude started to come back around. Just don't say very much when your attitude is really bad. Here's another action is to take advantage of the power of positive and spirit-lifting music. What king in the Old Testament used to hire musicians to come in and play for him when he was in a foul mood? Anybody remember what king it was? Saul. King, king Saul. Now, sometimes it didn't work, and he would get mad, and he actually threw a spear at one of the musicians. That's a tough gig. Okay, if they don't like it, they, they try to kill you. That doesn't usually happen. But at least King Saul recognized how music can affect a person's disposition. That's why Christ followers would do well to have Christian music CDs or worship music CDs in their cars, in our homes, in our workplaces if possible. I think this is particularly true first thing in the morning because that kind of sets the tone for your day. What do you tend to listen to the very first thing? Do you flip on the TV or the radio? Well, that is guaranteed to put you in a bad mood. You hear about the economy and uh, you know, pile up on the highway, abductions, terrorism, murders, more and more bad news. And that has a way of staying with you throughout the day. In fact, I, I used to always, for years, I woke up to a clock radio. Until one morning, the song I woke up to was Cocaine by Eric Clapton. And throughout the day, I'd just be going along, I'd be going, Cocaine, there, 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 there. It's like, this is not good. I, 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 I you should not be listening to that stuff the very first thing I hear in the morning. So why not start off with some music that can build and lift your spirit? Number five, consider the effect that food can have on your mood. Here's a book that I read that is about this very issue. Now, this author is not a Christian, but I was amazed at how much scientific data there is on how much your mood can be affected by your attitude by what you eat, whether good or bad. Here's another action step in taking responsibility for your attitude. When things aren't good, get some exercise. Go for a walk, ride a bike, lift weights, play tennis. There is an actual physiological reaction that will make you feel better. And if you exercise on a regular basis, it will be preventative in creating and having a bad attitude. How about call a friend or hang out with your favorite people? Haven't you ever noticed how when you're with some people, Afterwards, you always feel kind of down and grumpy, and when you're with other people, you walk away, you feel good, you're energized. Well, here's a little exercise for you. Sometime this week, take out a piece of paper 
and write down the names of the 10 or 15 people that you interact with most frequently. And then go back and put a letter beside each name, like D is for draining, people who have a draining, or for whatever effect, when you're around them, they have a draining effect on you. And then R would be replenishing. When you're around them, it always makes you feel good. And then N for neutral. Now, this is not the kind of list you want to leave lying around the house when the in-laws are in for the holidays, OK? But the idea is to minimize your exposure to the draining people as much as is reasonable and you know, purposefully schedule in time with those replenishing people. All right, number eight, for those of you keeping score at home, sit down and write out a list of the activities that drain you and activities that replenish you. If every time you do a certain thing or go do a in a certain place, if that makes you feel depressed, try not to go to that place, try not to do that thing. As much as possible, anyway, avoid activities that you know have a draining effect on you. Then do the things and go to the places that have a replenishing effect on you. If you have a good time, every, every time you're in the mountains, you feel replenished, you feel good, you feel closer to God or whatever, Every time you're working in the yard or playing music or going to the lake, make sure you do those things on a regular basis. Negative things have a way of forcing themselves into our schedules. So you have to have those replenishing things in, built in. It gives you something to look forward to. When things are hard, you go, yeah, but my wife and I are having a getaway two weeks in from now. You know, or I know I'm coming up, I'm going to this concert, or whatever it is that helps you build it into your schedule. The next one may seem like, well, you have to say this because we are in church, but I know how this can impact a person's attitude for the good, and that is simply showing up at church. Even if you're in a terrible attitude, bad mood, don't feel good, just get in the car and drive over here and get your body physically in this building. And I know we're busy, and some of us travel on weekends, or we have school or other things that, that you know we feel worn down. Or we say, man, you know, my business the last 12 months has been brutal. It's just a steady stream of bad news. All the charts are going in the wrong way. And when the weekend rolls around, I'm feeling be beat up. And a part of me says, you should go to church. It'll make you feel better. But then I don't have the energy. And I don't really want to. But some people have actually told me, e every time when I have felt that way, and I just made myself come, not only was my spirit nourished, but my attitude, you know, my attitude was lifted as well. And just to be honest, I think some of us maybe occasionally get a little too careless about how frequently we do this. But when you come into a place where the Bible is taught and you see people who know you and love you and, and we have some good music and maybe some good food, when that is brought into the equation in your life, a high percentage of the time you will leave with your soul and spirit and attitude lifted. Haven't you found that to be true? So you have to have this established as a pattern, a discipline in your life. The same could be said of our monthly Wednesday night services. And if we had time this morning, I could parade a whole bunch of people across this stage. And they would all take talk with great enthusiasm about how inspiring the worship is, about how moving the communion time is, how it draws them closer to God. It has a way of recharging their spiritual batteries. And they would tell you, as I would, that those once a month Wednesday night services, they always leave with their spirits and their souls and their attitudes soaring. Now, I'm aware that we all live in the real world. And that real world for some of us is tougher at times than it is for others of us. And life does have a way of dragging our attitudes into the gutter. Well, here's a verse for all of us, Philippians 4, verse 8. And I want to ask us today to do something unusual. I just want us to read it together. All right, read it with me in full voice. Here we go. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about things that are pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Now, that doesn't describe the news right there. You know, that doesn't describe most of the magazines that we maybe read, most of the music on the radio, most of the movies that we watch. But notice the first three words, fix your thoughts. There's an intentionality there. You know, you focus, what you focus on will often determine your attitude. You know, it can be seen in the direction our eyeballs are even pointing sometimes. You know, people who have more negative attitudes, they're always looking down, down at what they don't have. 
down at their problems, down at the unpleasant things in their lives. Or maybe you should be looking up, looking up to God, looking up with gratitude for what you do have, looking up for solutions, looking at the good things you know, that God has done in your life. I believe that people who consistently have great attitudes are people who have taken personal responsibility for it and who take action. They fight. Sometimes you have to fight every single day to develop and reinforce that habit to keep your gaze up, to focus on the positives in life. And let me point out that what we're talking about today here is very different than the kind of stuff you're likely to read in the self-help section over at Barnes & Noble. We're not talking about a naive optimism. We're not talking about how some people feel like they always need to put on the happy mask. You know, you ask them, you know, how things are going, and their marriage stinks, their finances are in the tank, they're drinking more than they used to, and you go, how's it going? And they feel like they got to keep up the facade. Great. Things are great. Well, we're talking about something much more substantial than that. We're talking about a faith-based optimism. Faith-based means because God is good. Because God is in charge of my life, because my life is in God's hands, I will choose to focus my eyes and my heart upward. And that will help me to have a lifted up spirit, even in this pessimistic, fouled up, fallen world. For me, besides knowing that God is good to me and that God will eventually take everything that happens in my life and cause it for my ultimate good, as Romans 8.28 says, Besides that, the next best thing to boost my attitude is my, my family. Here's my family unit right there on the, on the screen. I don't know, those of you who have had kids when they're, when they're little, sometimes they'll do things and it's, they're not really, they're due to something wrong, but it's really funny and you can't not laugh. You ever had that? You're trying to like teach them, don't do that, but it's so funny that you, you laugh anyway. Well, I remember one time when Michael was about six or seven years old and he wasn't getting along very well with a friend he had over. And I said, Michael, Jesus says that even when people are mean to us, we're supposed to be nice to them. He looked at me and said, Daddy, that'll never work. <laughs> now, as a pastor, I'm not supposed to laugh at that, see? But anyway. Well, speaking of things that don't work, I, I heard recently about a guy who was driving down the highway, and he was on a trip, and he decided to stop and get some gas and use the restroom. And he said, well, the first stall, when I went in the restroom, the first stall was occupied, so I went to the second one. He said, I was no sooner seated when I heard a voice from the next stall say, hi, how are you doing? Not knowing what, quite what to do, I said, not bad. He said, so what are you up to? Well, talk about your dumb questions. What does he think I'm up to? So the guy said, well, I answered anyway. Well, I'm driving on a trip, just like you. And then he, he heard the guy say, look, I got to call you right back. There's a moron in the next stall who's answering all the questions that I'm asking you. <laughs> So attitude is important. Is it possible to switch gears in a moment from a foul attitude to a good one? It is. Not easy. What's even harder is to change a lifelong bad attitude or negative attitude. And again, it may have a completely reasonable explanation because of what you've been through. But do you want to live the rest of your life like that? The state of your attitude, each job, each day, each situation, it's your job. Take some action. Keep your eyes focused up on God, on good and positive things. All right, well, if we had a commitment time here, you know, what would it mean for you to decide to choose the kind of attitude that you want to display on a regular basis? What would it mean to you? What would you have to do? Well, God will help you. God will help you, but you still have to be very engaged. You know, are you just going to hear these things today and kind of forget it? go back to the way things have been? Or are you maybe ready to finally say, dadgummit, you know, it's time. And with God's help, you know, and maybe taking some of these steps, I, this thing can really change. All right, well, before we have our big holiday potluck, I want to invite you guys to a very special Christmas-themed Wednesday night service. We're going to sing, basically, I think they're all cri Christmas songs. If you've never been into a Wednesday night service in your life, I'll get out of the way, you guys, so you can get up here. Uh, if you've never been to a Wednesday night service or haven't been to one in a very long time, this would be the perfect one to attend. You know, what I've learned, we've done several of these kind of Christmas, you know, time of the year Wednesday night services, and 
When we celebrate the birth of Christ, right alongside the death of Christ, remembering the death of Christ through communion, to me it's one of the most poignant times of the year to take communion. I hope that if you can make it, you'll be, we're right here, 7 o'clock Wednesday night, last an hour. Well, it's time for us to take the offering, and you'll notice on our November pie chart there that we were short again, and that was after, remember a couple of weeks ago I told you that somebody put a $5,000 special check in the offering, and that was including that. And so I thought of something today that I want to share with you, and it's this. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, when I was a child, I acted like a child. But he said, now that I'm older, now that I'm more mature, I put aside childish things. You know, I've been doing ministry for four decades now, and I, have, I think I've heard literally every reason or excuse uh, that people say, well, I don't give to God because. But I want to say today, if you've been a Christian five years or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, some of you 40 years, I bet some of you, it's time for some of us to put away some childish things. Regular adults are responsible financially, right? They pay their bills, they pay the mortgage, they provide for their children. Spiritually mature adults are responsible, you know, to obeying and honoring God, giving consistently and generously to his work. And so I just say this as a pastor who loves all of you guys and is concerned about you and also accountable to God, you know, for us and our church. Not giving or barely giving is, by definition, spiritually immature and childish. The Seeker Church is 11 years old. 11 years old, and yet we still have to talk about this way too frequently, don't we? Some of you have been fight followers of Christ 20, 30, 40 years, so I'm just saying, if the shoe fits or whatever, I'm not trying to make anybody mad. Some, for some of us, it's time to put away childish things and be the fully devoted Christ follower that you aspire to be. All right, let's pray, and then we're going to have, to, uh, have a potluck right after this. And so uh, let's pray, and we'll play a song during the offering, and then you guys can go out and get something to eat. Lord, we're grateful for the chance to be together as a church family today. We thank you for the people here that are newer, and, and uh, just pray you would continue to work in their lives, in the lives of their families, or their marriage, or you know, whatever it is that maybe they're facing. Lord, I'm grateful today for the opportunity to talk about things I've struggled with, you know, when I've been through really, really difficult times. Sometimes it took months or even years to really recapture the kind of spirit and attitude uh, that I know you would want in my life. I'm sure others have struggled too. Lord, we really want to honor you with our attitudes. We want to display the joy and the gratitude you know, that a person who has experienced salvation and eternal life should, should feel and display. But, or it is hard sometimes. Life is difficult. Things are unfair. And that God, in the midst of all that, by the promise of Romans 8, 28, that you're going to take even the rotten, terrible stuff and somehow, magically, by your spiritual whatever, turn it into something good for us. God, that we can be grateful even in the midst of the challenges. Lord, we pray that you'll bless this offering and our church. pray that you'll bless our time of eating together, that you'll bless the food. And we're grateful, God, for this opportunity to share this meal together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.